Thank you very much to Tess and Catherine uh, um, for organizing this and to uh, ADFS for inviting me. And thanks especially to the uh, donors and supporters of the uh, society who've, uh, uh, whose contributions have, have helped to make these uh, lectures free, which is wonderful. Um, and I'm delighted to see so many people here. I recognize a bunch of names uh, from ex-students, which is terrific, but also uh, I'm glad to see a bunch of names that I don't know. Um, and I'm looking forward to to at least having some kind of communication. Uh, we'll see how we go um, today. Um, I would say uh, someone messaged me uh, directly, um, but we're having an interesting situation where people's names appear to me as Julian Hoxter. So I just had Julian Hoxter uh, privately messaging me, which was a little bit uncanny and weird. So if I don't, if I don't reply to you, uh, I'm not being rude. Uh, you're coming up as me. Um, so fair warning. Uh, I, so may, maybe it's uh, better to, to say who you are if you want to message me or, or you want to uh, um, message and chat. Um, with that said, uh, what um, uh, uh, Tess and Catherine asked me to do was really to come in and give a lecture or a presentation that was pretty practical and pretty kind of brass tacks. Um, those of you who've been to my classes before, I am afraid there isn't going to be anything that new in the in the basic presentation. Uh, uh, but, you know, what I'm going to try and do is uh, go through some of the key uh, ideas, ways of thinking, um, techniques, um, models for thinking about, you know, how to begin to approach this strange topic, this strange skill called screenwriting. And um, uh, I'm going to keep an eye on the, on the watch, on the clock, but if someone, uh, if I haven't finished by, you know, um, uh, Oh, well, now it's 6.15, but if I haven't finished within an hour or so, uh, uh, maybe someone kind of remind me and I'll try and leave some uh, time for questions, if I can. Uh, so screenwriting is, a, is an odd kind of writing. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, its purpose, after all, is to disappear. Uh, the texts that we screenwriters write are superseded and made uh, redundant in many ways, um, that directors and actors and cinematographers and editors and uh, so many other people, sound, uh, uh, sound specialists and so on, take them over and add things to them uh, and hopefully enhance them, not always, but often. And, and so, you know, uh, uh, our writing is there to be transcended. And, and that takes a certain kind of mindset to be happy with that. You know, it's not like being a novelist where, you know, you have your editor, but otherwise that's your work. Um, screenwriting isn't quite like that. And that makes it, of course, in some ways, a wonderful and fascinating collaborative enterprise that, you know, one's working with a team of creative people, one's able to, you know, uh, to interact with them and take the best of what they're, what they're suggestion, suggesting one, to one to, uh, to in integrate and incorporate into the work. And of course, there are times when you have to just let the project go and it goes into other hands and, it, and, and you see it when it's finished. Um, so it's an, it's an odd enterprise in that way for a writer. But I think um, that is one of the most important starting points for us tonight, because what we need to understand is that we are writing for a team, that our screenwriting, that our work is there to be taken forward and, and there to be utilized in very particular and very specific ways, as well as very creative and perhaps unexpected ways by a whole team of, of professionals. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give a presentation. Uh, I've got a, some, you know, some slides and we'll, we'll pop in and out of them um, uh, to maybe explain how that works and to offer you a, a starting model, a, a way of thinking about, you know, how to begin to think like a screenwriter. Um, so without further ado, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, here we go. Um, and we will start the slideshow. Exciting. Uh, okay, so to start with, yeah, uh, excuse the oldest meme in the history of screenwriting on the right, but there we go. I, want, I, I was looking for something to fill the, fill the slide and that came up. So uh, I'm going to start by talking about what a screenplay is, because it's a very particular kind of document. Um, and then I'm going to start talking about format and story, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, story elements, you know, how we conceive of key ideas that drive our stories. And then we're going to talk about feature film structure, how feature films are, are how their stories are told. 
Um, and then if we have time, and I'm not sure we will today, I was going to kind of break out and talk a bit more about the context and how screenwriting works in the industry today. Because uh, uh, along with being a screenwriter and a, um, um, a story consultant, uh, I'm an academic and I study the industry and I, and I write books on screenwriting and screenwriting history. So I've edited a, 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 a book on the history of screenwriting. Uh, I've co-written a book about screenwriting in, in the, uh, American uh, um, industry uh, in the last 20 years or so, and, uh, uh, and some others, along, along with writing you know, more kind of practical hands-on how-to manuals. Um, but we, maybe we get to some of that in Q&A, we'll see how we go. But let's start by talking about screenplays what screenplays are and how they work and who we're, who we're writing for. And, and some of this, I imagine some of this you know, so I'm going to go over it relatively quickly. Um, but of course, if there's anything anyone wants more details on, we can, we can address that uh, as we go. Uh, and the first thing to say is that a screenplay has two linked functions, um, that it's both a literary document and a technical document. So a screenplay is first and foremost a literary document because it's you telling a story and your story needs to be compelling just as if, if it was any other medium. Uh, and nothing should get in the way of it being compelling. But it's also a document that communicates important and specific information to other technical professionals and creative professionals who are working on the project. Everything from the casting director to the cinematographer to the editor to the person who provides blood effects in the... In the uh, uh, example to the right for The Godfather. Um, so special effects uh, uh, props have looked through this particular script, which is from The Godfather, and have noted the scenes where they need to bring things, into, uh, uh, in this case, blood effects, because it's The Godfather, so there's lots of dead bodies. Uh, so your, your document, your screenplay, needs to communicate story and technical professional context. And that means that it needs to be an efficient document in terms of the way it's laid out. It needs to present information in ways that your fellow professionals will expect to find it. Otherwise, they're searching through things and, and that's rude, frankly. Uh, uh, one tries to treat one's fellow professionals uh, uh, with respect and therefore one tries to provide the information that they need where they expect to find it in the form they expect to find it. So again, as I say, uh, um, this aspect of, uh, of screenwriting, of writing a screenplay, sits interestingly, sometimes dissonantly perhaps, alongside the, the literary function uh, of storytelling. And one of the first things to, to, to note, and again, I don't think this will be a surprise to anybody really, is that unlike a novel, which can be, you know, Proustian, can be a thousand pages, or it can be a tight, a tight novella, I'm um, thinking of Julian Barnes' sense of an ending or something. Um, the, a screenplay really has to be of a certain length. Um, and unless you are writing to assignment and you have dispensation to go outside of this boundary, typically a screenplay will be roughly uh, uh, 90 to 120 pages. Less than 90, people wonder if there's a re really a feature there, more than 120, and they think you should probably be editing, probably be cutting it down. And again, the reason why those page lengths uh, um, are there is because the way a screenplay is formatted, and again, this may probably not be a surprise to most of you, uh, is that um, well, over the years, screenplays have been formatted so that a, a page equals a minute on screen, relatively accurately, surprisingly accurately. Of course, if you write a scene that says we watch the sun go down for 10 minutes, well, you know, you just broke that rule. But um, in, in general, the way the formatting works, the way uh, the, the, the technical and creative aspects of screenwriting work, uh, um, we end up with a 90 minute script, a 90, sorry, 90 page script taking about 90 minutes on screen, give or take, but it's a, it's a, a fairly close um, approximation. And um, you know, some genres play slower or faster. Comedy tends to play faster, for example. You usually get more uh, more pages for, for your time with comedy, particularly if it's kind of fast banter comedy. Um, but, you know, uh, these things are, are kind of taken into account. So that means that when you're writing a screenplay, when you're, when you're thinking like a screenwriter, one of the first and most important principles to bear in mind is what I call narrative economy. You, you've only got that 90 to 120 page uh, um, budget 
of, pa of, of pages, of scenes, of content, of story. So your job is to get the most value from it, uh, get the most information, the most detail, the most drama from those pages. So, you know, one of the key ways of thinking like a screenplay, a screenwriter, is to think about how can I get more from my scenes? How can I get more from my story? How can I pack more into my 90 pages? So narrative economy as a principle of screenwriting, as a first, you know, first kind of metaphorical post-it to put on your computer screen to say, okay, I, I have to have this in mind when I'm going forward and trying to be a screenwriter. Uh, this is very, very important. Um, and it, it means as much, uh, it, can mean, it can mean anything uh, from, you know, trying to make scenes do more jobs than they, than they are in your first, than they have in your first draft. It can mean simply trying to say the same thing in fewer words. You know, uh, if you've got a long sentence of description or of action, um, you know, how can you make it say the same? How can you communicate, can you convey the same drama, the same emotion, the same context, but with fewer words? So again, when we think about that, one of the big principles of screenwriting as a technical exercise is encapsulation, trying to say more with fewer words um, and without betraying the creative and literary intent of your story either. And, and that's a trick, that's an interesting trick. And, and it gets easier with practice, of course, but everyone's first drafts, for example, are long, apart from that one guy, but you know, everyone's, everyone's first drafts are long. When I write a screenplay, I typically write first drafts of 130 to 150 pages. Uh, and, I don't, and that's fine. I allow myself to do that because sometimes I have to work things out, write my way into scenes and so on. But, um, uh, uh, you know, I know that I'm going to cut a bunch down and I can usually cut out 10 to 20 pages just by condensing my language, not throwing out whole scenes. Um, so um, the, the next thing to say, and this is, you know, very pedantic, but it's also true. You write a screenplay in courier font, I, what we would call typewriter font. And we do that for a reason. And that is because that's part of the equation, the kind of part of the built-in equation of one page equals one minute, is that one page written in 12 point courier font equals one minute. And one of the reasons why courier font has stayed as the default font for writing screenplays, um, uh, this is really kind of inside baseball stuff, but you know, bear with me, inside cricket, I suppose I should say, but never mind, is um, because courier font doesn't kern meaning it, do, it, it doesn't adjust to fill space on the page. When you write a letter, it takes a, a, a when you type a letter or print a letter, it takes exactly the, the, the same amount of space and you know where it is. Other fonts often are, are, are um, kern, often, often adapt to fill space on pages. So courier font. And we also write in what's called master scene format. And master scene format is a kind of post Hollywood classical uh, uh, format. Uh, which comes in for a range of reasons, which I'm not going, uh, going to go into right now, but if anyone's interested, I can talk about it in Q&A. Um, and the big change from screenplays written in the 30s and 40s to screenplays written in the 50s and afterwards, and it was gradual, but broadly speaking, is a shift from a format in which a screenplay was a list of shots to a format in which a screenplay is a list of scenes separated by time and location. And uh, um, the screenplay the master scene format screenplay, the kind of screenplay that we read now and we write now, is written um, without calling shots, with notable exceptions, uh, without uh, um, giving technical information wherever possible, but focusing on telling the story of the scene. So you tell the story of what happens in the scene, you don't speak it as a series of shots. Sometimes for clarity and economy, you have to call a shot. And sometimes it's dynamic to do so, but in general, you don't call shots. You don't go close up, Joe does this. Um, uh, medium shot, Joe continues to do this. That's not how things work. So with those kind of principles in mind, uh, let's have a very quick look at screenplay format. And I'm talking fairly quickly now because you know, I, I wanna make sure we can get through as much of this as possible in the time we have. Um, so there are six elements of, uh, six core elements of screenplay format and two kind of minor ones. And uh, when you know these six elements, you'll basically be able to write a screenplay. There are always little uh, um, clever things that you can do and there are books that can help you do this. But really quickly, I'm gonna go through them. You'll see there's an example on the right, which I hope you guys can read. It's a little bit small, but. I think, it, I think it's workable. And the first of these uh, um, elements is a transition. 
and a transition tells you how we get from one scene to the next. So we cut to, we dissolve to, we wipe to, and here, here in this example, at the very beginning of the, uh, um, the script, we have fade in, that's a transition. And then after the first scene on the right hand side, dissolve to. Uh, so this is an instruction um, that really applies to post-production, but also lets us visualize how the story will develop. We usually don't bother, certainly not in a, in a spec screenplay, in a screenplay that you're writing with the hope of selling, but no one's asked you to. We usually don't bother with writing cut to because it's, that's the default, that's obvious. And only if we're doing something else, something clever, something uh, eloquent, like a, using a dissolve, would we bother to say that. But there we go, transition. The next element is what we would call a slug line or um, uh, you know, uh, C introduction. And if you look on the example to the right, you'll see the first one is a second line and it says EXT writer's store day, okay? Um, this, by the way, is an example, uh, a screenplay example that I got from the writer's store. So I thank the writer's store for letting us use it. Um, so uh, uh, a slug line has three pieces of information. It tells us in this order, whether a scene takes place inside or outside, int or x, not interior, not exterior, int period, or ext period. Or if we move from one to the other, we can go int slash x or i slash e, as you'll see later down uh, uh, in this example on the page. Um, then we we put the location. In this case, writer store. So exterior writer store colon. Oh, sorry, um, uh, hyphen, uh, and then the time of day. Typically just day or night, but if it's dawn or dusk or some, uh, uh, um, then then that's something we might also put in. Um, and we might also, if a scene takes place directly after the one previously, we might put continuous instead of that. So whatever applied to the previous scene, but we don't, we don't need to get too far into that. And then we have action or description. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we write action description uh, um, in a moment. Uh, but here in this first scene, in the heart of West Los Angeles, a boutique, no longer there, I'm afraid, a boutique shop's uh, large open sign glows like a bee. Okay, so that's where we, where we put the information that gives us context, makes us understand what the action is, what's happening in the scene. Then the next element is the character name. And if we go down the, the page a few points, we see here the, in this example, the first character name that turns up is Anthony. And by character name, I mean the character name before dialogue. Uh, you may mention the character in the description, but uh, um, we have Anthony in this case, uh, which is centered on the page. And then beneath the character name, uh, we may have a parenthetical. That's the next element. And you'll see one uh, when you look down the page, uh, beneath the, the, the sales counter, beneath Anthony, we have voice. And then we have a little um, parenthesized, is that a word it is now? Parenthesized description over phone. That would be a parenthetical. That gives context to the, uh, the dialogue to come. So for example, if I had a scene where someone spoke Spanish, um, and this is a, a, you know, a written for American readers who don't necessarily speak Spanish. Of course, if I, if I was writing in Spanish, I would just write in Spanish, um, uh, you know, for Mexican television or whatever. But uh, um, I would put in Spanish so people would know that they would need to have that translated, have a, an actor who can speak Spanish. Um, so those are parentheticals. Uh, then we have dialogue. So as you see under the, uh, uh, the character name of Anthony, he, he says a line or two and we have enthusiast and we have voice and so on in, in these examples. And th those are the core elements of screenplay format. You organize the information in that way. And then people, people expect that and they understand that when you write in that way. Uh, which isn't to say that you can't sometimes do creative things, but you need to make sure that your writing looks like a screenplay. Otherwise people begin to get suspicious and think, well, what are they doing? This doesn't look like what I'm expecting a screenplay to look like. There are also two minor elements, which I'll mention very briefly. There is the extension, um, which is, again, a different kind of contextual statement. If you look down near the bottom of the page, you'll see under uh, um, interior, exterior, luxurious Malibu mansion day, you'll see Anthony has a, a par parenthetical of O dot S dot, um, which in this case means off screen. Um, so an extension basically gives important information like off screen or voiceover or something like that. Um, and then there's the shot. And a shot uh, is when you're actually calling a shot. Uh, and we'll see an example of this uh, in, a, in a little bit down the track. 
and again, as I say, we try not to call shots, but sometimes it's it's uh, inevitable. We can't really avoid it, short of putting in some big explanation. Um, and sometimes it can be dynamic and interesting, um, but in general, we try and avoid them. Okay, real quick then, that was just ripping us through the basic format of a screenplay. There's a very, very good book, I, and for the life of me, I can't remember the author, I will try and find that, um, called The Hollywood Standard, uh, which I recommend to anyone who wants a book that gives you basically the answers on anything you'd wanna know about screenplay format. It's not a book you read, it's a book you go and you find an example and you go, oh, I see, and then you, you write it in. And I, inevitably, I will use that book two or three times in each script. There'll be something that I can't remember how to do or, or something where I want a, a different way of doing. And, um, and that book will help me. There are a couple like that. The one I use is, is the Hollywood Standard and I, and I think it's excellent. Um, let's move forward. So, you know, now let's think a little bit uh, creatively about how we do the actual writing. And we'll talk about story and story structure in a minute. Uh, but again, this is really just trying to get you kind of in the head of a screenwriter uh, and think about, well, how do we approach these, these tasks as technical tasks and as creative and literary tasks? Uh, so how do we write, um, description, action, as we'd say. And the first principle is, you know, again, with narrative economy in mind, the idea that you only have a certain number of pages to fill, so you wanna make the most, you wanna make the most of every word. Uh, the, the first uh, um, principle here, I would say, is, you know, don't over-describe. Try and find uh, uh, a line, a phrase, that will give me an image that I can work with rather than trying to describe everything. I don't need to know every badge on some guy's uniform. I need to know what it feels like. Does it feel like scary Nazi or does it feel like less scary a US Marine? You know, I don't know, whatever it happens to be. Um, the second is avoid big paragraphs. Use white space. White space is your friend. And that may seem counterintuitive when I've just said, you know, you need to find all the space you can, but you also need to make the read an attractive proposition. Because the people who read your screenplay, when you have you know, a wall of text, suddenly they go, oh, I don't want to read that. Um, and that's not your friend when you want someone to like your screenplay. So the idea is that you use discrete but eloquent, if you will, thought images, moments that, that, that uh, will encapsulate a moment in the scene then you put a line of white space and then you go to the next one. Uh, it doesn't mean you, that you, you can't write short paragraphs, of course you can, but you want to make the read flow. You want to make people feel that they are reading in a good pace and not getting held up in big blocks of text. Um, and then the next thing is think about what this scene that you're writing will feel like on the screen. And I mean feel like. What is its affect going to be like? Is it emotionally terrifying or frightening or uh, fast and dynamic or laid back and cool? Or what is it you're trying to say? Um, and try and anticipate the affect of the film scene on the page. So when I read your scene, I want it to feel as much as it can like the experience of actually being, uh, being in the cinema and watching what that scene will be like. So your style may vary significantly uh, when you're writing different kinds of fiction and different kinds of scenes within a single screenplay. And the, the faster things get, you know, here we're writing action in terms of action sequences and so on, or, or fast dynamic scenes. The faster things get, the less you are beholden to the laws of grammar and syntax. Um, and as long as you're, you write well, everyone will understand that who's writing, reading your screenplay and will not care. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the need to write in full sentences breaks down. The ability of a phrase to carry an idea and then to move forward uh, uh, comes in. The idea that you can use, as in this example from the Born Identity, uh, you can use, you know, hyphenation to kind of take us in a staccato way, which, which sort of resembles the jump cuts that will be in the scene when it's actually filmed. Um, the more you can do that, the more I feel that I'm in that, in that frame. If I'm writing a, a, a different kind of scene, a kind of slow, dramatic, uh, slow boil of emotions, I would write in a very different style. But this is just an example to show you what you can begin to do when you allow yourself as a screenwriter to take liberties with style and to kind of write to genre 
and I'm, you guys I'm, I'm sure can, can or have been reading the example on the right, so I won't go over it in detail, but you can see I'm, I'm, I would have thought some of what I'm saying in this example from um, Gilroy's script. Um, and also, I'll draw, draw, your, draw your attention really quickly to down the bottom, where we actually do have an example of shot calling. So the man's hand slams down on Giancarlo's and we smash cut, we smash cut into a first person point of view. Okay, so now we've changed scene, we've changed location into a point of view structure, which is Jason Bourne waking up. Uh, we're staring up at Giancarlo. You're awake, can you hear me? Okay, so that's a very dynamic and particular use of shot calling. Um, and an example of where, it, in the context of, of this kind of writing, this kind of genre writing, uh, I think is well done. Um, but no, you would not use this everywhere. You, this is not how you write every kind of scene in the screenplay. I just think, I think it's quite a useful example to give you a sense of this idea of trying to match affect on the page with affect on the screen. How we'll feel about that, or at least a hint of it. Of course, it can't be the same thing. Okay, so. Uh, having introduced what a screenplay is and how you might begin to think about the challenges of writing uh, um, in that context, and we'll talk about story structure in a minute. I want to think about um, some of the key principles of storytelling. And you know, we begin with a very simple statement, right? A story is causality with a conclusion. It has some kind of internal logic that drives it. Because causality, cause and effect, uh, brings with it coherence. Um, you know, one thing leads to another and we make those connections uh, uh, and, and we understand why, why we've gone from one idea to the next. It doesn't mean that everything has to be literal and tedious. It means that you need to give us some kind of road to follow, some kind of path to follow so that we, we the audience, will be with you. Um, we can enjoy being confused if we don't think you're confused, by the way. So causality brings coherence, but stories may be built on different kinds of causal systems. So there's a causality of events, which is plot, plot right? Plot happens and, and it makes sense because one thing leads to another. But there's also emotional causality. There's, you know, people react because of how they've been treated before, because of, of, of uh, um, what their emotional stance is vis-a-vis -vis another character, you know? And those changes pr produce a, a, a causal logic of their own. So there are different, and there are other ways of thinking about causality, but, the, but this is kind of one of the basic principles of any kind of storytelling and certainly movie storytelling. Um, and that leads me to, you know, how do we cohere a story? And one of the key shortcuts to it in, in screenwriting thinking would be to focus on the idea of theme. In fact, we're gonna talk about theme and arc and story and plot. And we'll have a, 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 an example to show you how that, how that works. And uh, so theme is, uh, and your, your, your story may have many themes, it may be about a whole bunch of different things, that's cool, but it will typically have one driving organizing theme. Um, uh, and, and a theme is something like, you know, I don't know, love, betrayal, friendship, uh, fatherhood. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, you, you, can, you, can, you get the idea. Growing up, um, uh, forgiveness, um, in certain words of your choice. Uh, because there are many stories that you can tell about a certain character, but the theme disciplines you and makes you focus on the thing that this particular story is about. Uh, the time when this character learned to be a better dad or mum or whatever. Um, and so theme is a very important idea because it tames your wild words, to use a term that I love from uh, a British anthropologist, Mary Douglas. Um, it tames your wild words. It makes your characters consistent, which doesn't mean they have to have the same attitude to their theme all the way through. And, and that brings us to character arc, that an arc is a way of, of expressing the emotional and personal journey that a character takes through a story. Um, and, you know, let's say the theme is love. Well, your attitude to love may, may change radically during the film based on your experiences of a relationship. Uh, but that doesn't stop the theme being love, yeah? It's still love, even though we may have changed our, our opinion. Um, and similarly, uh, uh, screenwriters, uh, you know, talk about uh, uh, the distinction between story and plot. And these are important terms to get our heads around. And again, we're, we're gonna go through these in examples in a minute. 
Um, so in this sense, you know, plot, it, it, to take them in the reverse order, plot, it, uh, you know, the, the events that we see on screen, things happen, um, the surface of the text, if you want. And story is subtext. Story is what's going on in, inside, uh, which is much harder to access in, in movies than it is in novels, for example, because we don't have internal dialogue. Uh, unless we have, you know, a very particular kind of voiceover narration like you might have in a film noir. But, but in general, films don't allow us the access to internal dialogue, so we have to find other ways of accessing how a character feels and, and, and how they're thinking. Uh, clue. We do that through the B story, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so story and plot we think of as distinct, and one informs the other. Um, but let's have a, a look uh, at how that works. And the way I do this in my classes, uh, some people know this all too well, is to use the example of a wardrobe. Uh, so in this example, here's a wardrobe. Um, and the wardrobe in this, in this analogy, bear with me, we, we'll, we'll get through this. Um, in this analogy, uh, um, represents the theme of the story. It's big, it's thick, unless you bought it from Ikea, in which case it's not, but you know, let's hope you, you've had a bit more money to spend and you went somewhere else and you have a big, thick, sturdy wardrobe. Um, and it's unchanging, yeah? You can shake it around, but it's not going anywhere. And, it's, and in terms of storytelling, it's definitional and disciplined. Um, and then if we look closer at the wardrobe, we see that it has a clothes rail, right? Where we hang our clothes on, and again, bear with me with the analogy. So the clothes rail in, the, in this analogy, in this example, represents the character arc. Uh, and what's important is that it's bolted on to the theme. So the character arc is very much related to the theme of the film, the core theme of the film. But um, again, the attitudes to the core theme may change as the story develops, but the theme itself stays the same. So again, you know, we might have a romantic comedy where, for example, at the beginning, you have a character who has been burned too many times in the dating scene, uh, you know, too many people who play games, and they're done. They're like, I'm done, I'm, I'm out, I'm, I, I can't deal with this anymore. And then, of course, they meet the boy, girl, whoever of their dreams. Um, and of course, they, they have to deal with that, uh, that change of attitude, right? Suddenly, I'm in love again, what do I do? Um, and, and indeed, every character in the movie will have an attitude that may shift around. So again, the analogy is that we may, in this example, we may be at different points, in a, a different kind of um, uh, context, different parts of the, parts of the movie uh, to our theme, uh, but the theme isn't changing. Our attitudes may change. So wardrobe, clothes rail, we're getting there. I know this is kind of silly, but you know, I think it makes sense. Our third uh, element for this analogy is story beats. Um, and we represent them with clothes hangers. Um, so the clothes hangers hang on to the character arc, which is linked to the theme. Uh, without uh, the arc and the theme, they would fall on the floor. You wouldn't have coherence. But the story beats represent elements where the, the subtext, the, the, character, the character's journey down their arc towards the conclusion of the story, uh, are noticeable and marked um, because story is about character change uh, other than the most plot driven stories. Most stories are about character change in some way because if you're the same person that you uh, at the end as you are at the beginning well the story did have the events had no effect on you so what what was the point of them you know. Uh, um, so okay so close hangers story beats and then the fourth element on those close hangers we hang clothes and they're hopefully uh, attractive and uh, uh, stylish. And uh, uh, my, my wife kindly drew these for me. Uh, and, and I think she, she's fantasizing about Duran Duran from the jacket in the middle, but never mind. Um, uh, that the, uh, the, the clothes represent the plot. Um, and and, and that why that's a useful a uh, analog is because, you know, they're visual and bright and interesting or cool or uh, edgy or trendy or just functional. Um, uh, and, but without the clothes hangers, they fall on the floor. The clothes hangers, without the, um, the, the character arc, without the theme, everything would fall on the floor. So again, plot beats are the events that we see on the screen and plot is the text to story subtext. So to put it all together, this silly analogy of the basis, the absolute basic concepts of storytelling in a, in a screenplay, 
the wardrobe model reminds us that theme is, is, is unchanging. And when it's unchanging, everything else holds up. If it changed, everything would, in this, in this example, would fall on the floor. You have a mess of clothes and, character, uh, and, and rail and hangers and all the rest of it. Um, but when you have it together, when you have a character's arc that relates coherently to, to the theme, and when you have story and plot that build on that, then you have a coherent story. And the same applies for an action movie as it does for a, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, a historical drama as it does for a romantic comedy, as it does for a Western, as it does for a character drama. Um, the, basic, the basic connection between theme and arc and story and plot. So uh, I see someone with a hand up. Uh, uh, I'm not, let me come out of the presentation for a minute. Um, uh, so Raquel had a question. Or is that something else? I'm not sure what I'm seeing there. Um, okay, uh, maybe not. Okay, I'll go back in. One moment. Sorry, I've given her the ability or them to the ability to unmute. One moment. Ah, okay. Yeah. Raquel, okay, there her. we go. <laughs> um, now, I know you were discussing how it's first theme and then character arc, but I know that there's different types of character arc, like you have transformational, sure. positive change, negative change. A uh, one, which is not super common, but it does exist for certain, certain things is a flat arc, like your Sherlock Holmes, Hercule right. Perret, right. Indiana Jones. Right. So how do you go about that if you have a flat character arc? Well, I think that that's interesting. I mean, I think what you're de dealing with, uh, you, know, um, you know, is often a very plot driven film where what we're not looking for is development in terms of character. What we're looking for is the intricacies of plot. So their plot is dominant. Um, and again, the, the, the plot has its own logic, um, but the character is, uh, particularly a detective character like Sherlock Holmes, the detective character is still, you know, by their genius, um, uh, by, you know, it's Hercule Poirot, by his little graces, uh, you know, is making connections and, and moving things forward in the discovery of the plot. So the, the same basic principle applies. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, flat arcs are basically the kind of arc that you get with a character whose whole point is that they don't develop, um, that they have no, I mean, you know, um, I'm trying to think of other, other examples. Um, well, every character Clint Eastwood's played, no, that's unfair. Um, <laughs> William Money has an arc. But um, I, 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 yes, uh, 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 th there are characters whose who's very definition is that they're unchanging, um, but still, um, because of their presence, because of their interactions, they're moving the plot forward. Um, so, you know, the story may be, may be small in relation to um, uh, 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 the plot in terms of the, the, its importance, but it's still there in some form. Uh, let me carry on for a bit. Uh, okay, where am I? There we go. All right, so, So with those ideas in mind, with that, with that, that those principled ideas in mind, so my dog is now saying hello, hello, um, thinks it needs attention, uh, I think you do, yes. Um, with those in mind, let's draw our attention, I'm, I'm skating through this real fast so we can hopefully get to uh, uh, through it all. Um, let's think a little bit about, well, what is a feature film and how does it work? Um, and, you know, I think, uh, again, there are, there are terms that I'm sure you've heard that we can talk about, you know, in more detail down the track, but, uh, you know, we think of, in screenwriting, we think of uh, feature films, the structure of a feature film um, in terms of acts and beats and scenes and sequences. Um, and of course, there are unconventional uh, uh, feature formats, but I'm talking about relatively conventional movies now. Um, you know, not, the, not, not just the most conventional, um, you know, I would certainly include most indie movies and so on under this rubric, um, uh, but anything other than very experimental or, or, or really, uh, um, obscure art films. Um, last year at Marion Bat, for example, would be, would be an interesting take. I haven't done the, uh, the analysis, but we'll have to see how that works. So um, typically in Hollywood anyway, the idea of the three act structure is important. 
Uh, you may not conceive of your story in three acts, but when you go and talk to somebody in Hollywood, they probably will, or at least they will expect you to speak in a language that um, uh, addresses the idea of three acts, because they've been trained to do that. Um, and indeed, screenwriters had a major impact on that, particularly Sid Field, writing his, his book, Screenplay, in 1979, really introduced the idea of the, screen, the, 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 the three act structure as a kind of default uh, language for um, uh, Hollywood uh, uh, development. Um, so uh, it's useful to know about three act structure, even if that's not you know, exactly how you go and how you think about um, uh, movie making. Some people think in sequences, for example. Other people think in terms of four or five acts. Uh, and, and there are a, a range of, of different possibilities. But the three act structure very loosely uh, um, uh, uh, following uh, a kind of model established by Aristotle over 2000 years ago, um, really is about a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, uh, but each of these terms, beginning, middle, and end, means something quite specific in, in screenwriting, in conventional movie, movie making. And we'll talk about what they do mean in a minute. We also think of, of stories as in terms of beats. And beat, a beat is one of these words in screenwriting that um, turns up in different contexts and means different things. So you can think of beats within a scene, moments where the drama turns within a scene. Someone reveals information. Someone um, says something to turn the emotional uh, um, uh, impetus of the scene. That is what, that's what actors look for uh, um, to guide their performance, for example. Those are scene beats. But we can also think of story beats, which we can conceive of at various uh, um, scales of magnification. Um, and I'll show you an example of this in a minute. Uh, a beat, a beat in the, under this rubric is when a, a story advances significantly in some way. A story or a plot advances significantly in some way. Something significant happens that moves us forward, that makes us feel that we've made progress, however you define progress in the terms of your story. Um, and of course, we can also, you know, break movies down into scenes. Uh, uh, you know, a scene is a, a discrete piece of action, typically uh, bounded by time and space. So you would change a scene when either we sh shift ahead to a different time or we change location or both. Um, but, you know, again, scenes are a way of breaking down our story into digestible components and thinking about, you know, how, what scenes do I need to express whatever I'm trying to express um, at a given time in my film. And sequences, again, are, are a very useful model. A sequence, of course, is a um, a group of scenes which together do a thing. Uh, so sometimes a, a beat is a sequence as well. Um, uh, uh, so sequences, you know, can be a very useful uh, uh, marker of the development of story in the screenplay. So we'll see all this when we look whoops, at a model of movie storytelling. And this is the one that I use in my own classes um, as a kind of introductory, as a starting point, as a, you know, a piñata uh, for us to, piñata, uh, for us to kind of, you know, look at and beat apart and see how it works. Uh, it doesn't apply to every story, uh, but I think, it, you know, it has the value not only of applying to many, but also of kind of encapsulating graphically some of the, the key questions that we usually would be asking ourselves at a given point in a, in a movie story. And we call it, as, for reasons that should be obvious, we call it the W model of feature film storytelling. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, uh, if you look at the bottom of the diagram, you'll notice that it has three acts. Act one is the, the first angle. Um, act three is the final angle. And act two has two angles up and down. Uh, and one could, I suppose, think of it as a four act model, but I, but I, I don't for reasons that I'll explain. So I'm going to go, uh, you know, Life's too short, right, to do this in endless detail. But I'm going to go through it in really fast, and we can, and we can um, we can come back and talk about details. But just to give you a sense of the kind of things that screenwriters think about when they're thinking about, you know, what happens at a certain point in the story. So um, first acts are relatively straightforward in most mainstream and indie movies. Again, I'm I'm, I'm leaving. Uh, uh, um, uh, so radical art movies and experimental films out of this discussion. Um, and not, again, not all movies follow exactly this format, but many do. And uh, we can look at 
these elements at different levels of magnification. So there's an act, and we take the act as this whole first angle of the W, um, and then there are different layers of beats. And I'm gonna mostly go through what I would call the big beats of the story, just for reasons of time and, and, and you know, not wanting to, to put you all to sleep. And the big beats, if you look in the gray, the thick gray line, you'll see that there's white, there's white writing. So in the first act, we have two big beats that are typically there in um, a Hollywood movie or in uh, um, relatively mainstream movies, primary exposition and debate. So in uh, a mainstream movie, primary exposition introduces us to the world of the story, to our protagonist uh, or protagonists and to what they want, their wants, their needs, their desire. Um, and that can happen in lots of different ways. Um, and different genres have their own uh, traditions in terms of how many of these things happen. Uh, but what we need to know at the end of that beat is what is missing in our protagonist's life, what they want, what they need, um, what they're going to try and get by the end of the story. And that can be an emotional thing and it can be a physical thing, it can be an, anything you like. Um, or in a plot-driven movie, it's when the bad thing happens that sets our, our protagonist up for having to try and solve it. The monster up here, the aliens invade, whatever it happens to be. Uh, so something happens and we call that, that thing usually an inciting incident. Something happens that incites the drama, that it provides the catalyst for our protagonist to go and do whatever they need to do in the story. Uh, boy meets girl, aliens invade. Um, uh, uh, father disinherits son, I don't know. Um, so whatever it is that you want to do will typically happen at that moment. Uh, and that carries with it a, um, that carries with it uh, what the screenwriting teacher, Robert McKee calls uh, an obligatory moment. The, um, the inciting incident somewhere on this first, uh, uh, towards the middle of the first act uh, carries with it an unknown obligatory moment, something that we know will happen in act three that will resolve that inciting incident. Uh, so we immediately, something happens that sets the story in motion, we're thinking ahead and we're making an assumption that there's going to be a scene that resolves it in some way. We don't know how, uh, we may be thinking about possibilities. Uh, you know, again, um, to be very reductive, will boy get girl, will get girl get girl, will boy get boy, will, I, I, I'm running out of options. Um, um, whatever option you like, uh, and will it stick, for example? Well, we'll find that out at the end. Um, but the inciting incident makes us think forward towards an unknown future, to begin to engage with the story uh, in that way. And then we have a debate, we have a, a beat called debate, typically. And this happens, you'll see this in almost every film. And typically there'll be a moment of hesitation and then a kind of first commitment from the character. So the hesitation will be, oh, it's too hard. Uh, he's out of my league, uh, or whatever it is. Um, I can't defeat all the aliens, don't be silly. Um, uh, but then something will happen that will reinforce to our protagonist that they, they want to try or they have to try. Um, and by the end of the first act, they'll have made a first commitment to try and resolve their need, their goal. Um, and what's important about that first commitment is that it often is ignorant. Oh, well, this, this'll be easy, it won't. Or it's very contingent. Yeah, I'll try, but, um, you know, so uh, uh, it, it will need to be reinforced. But by the end of the first act, that's that unit of drama doing its job. By the end of the first act, your protagonist or protagonist will be off on their, on their journey, off on their path towards trying to resolve whatever they need to resolve in order to make things better uh, for them or for the world or for um, people they love. Um, then we're gonna skip the second act for a minute. Then the third act, which is the up angle at the end, the third act, uh, uh, again, is relatively straightforward in terms of how we think about its structure, even though it may be very, very uh, dense and intricate in terms of how it's actually written, and basically comes in two big beats, confrontation and resolution. So confrontation is, um, well, I should say, by the end of the second act, your, um, your protagonist has figured out how they might actually achieve what it is that they want to achieve. 
the end of the first act, they know what they want to do, but they don't have really a snowball's chance in hell of doing it. By the end of the second act, they have a snowball's chance in hell. Um, and so the first thing that they do in the third act is to enact some kind of plan. Uh, this is, I've worked it out. This is how I'm going to do the thing. Um, and then, of course, stories have antagonists. Stories have oppositional forces, which may be people, maybe you know, uh, uh, environments, could be, could be many different kinds of things. And there will be pushback, right? If it was easy, it would be a boring story. So there'll be some kind of pushback to that plan. Um, and if you have a well-written antagonistic force, it'll be hard to break, even if the plan is a good one. And then there's the resolution lead. So somehow uh, the need at the beginning of the film will be resolved. Boy gets girl, insert gender and preference of your choice. Um, or doesn't, but learn something from their failure. Um, that's a different kind of resolution and one that Hollywood is less interested in, but you know, welcome to indies. Um, so there will be a logical causal resolution of some kind. Doesn't mean that every little tiny thread has to be neatly tied up. And this of course is one of the critiques of Hollywood movies that you know, uh, they're unrealistic because things get tied up um, uh, in unrealistic ways. But somehow the, the need, the character's need, the character's arc will be resolved in success or in glorious failure of some kind. And then typically movies have a beat of resonance a beat where we see the world change. So the world at the beginning and the world at the end of your film are not quite the same. If they were, then nothing happened of interest in your story. Or their very sameness is in itself a change in some way. Um, so we'll often have a moment or a scene, or in the case of um, the third Lord of the Rings movie, three hours uh, in which you know, the movie wraps itself up. Uh, you know, that it, 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 it takes the time to show the impact, the resonance of the story once it's resolved. Often it's, you know, a short scene. Um, you know, the, famously in at the, uh, um, oh gosh, what's that movie called? Uh, it's gone, never mind, I'll come back to it. So, all right, so we have a first act and a third act. Uh, so, so what then is the job of the second act? And second acts are typically the most difficult to write. Ask any screenwriter, they'll, they'll tell you. Apart from that one guy, and we hate that one guy. Uh, so a second act gets your protagonist or your protagonists from deciding they want to do a thing, but really not having much chance of doing it, to having a chance of doing it. So what happens in act two is character change. This is where your character or your characters become able to do the thing. They have experiences, they learn from those experiences. They, in a plot driven movie, they, you know, collect, they go on a quest and they get the sword of whatever, uh, um, they're able to do the thing. Um, and a second act has a, a, a rather intricate structure in most Hollywood movies. I uh, hear I'm not really talking about sort of big bloated epics like the MCU, I'm talking about, um, you know, uh, um, more character driven stories. Uh, um, those MCU movies have a different kind of internal logic, perhaps. Um, so again, when we look at the first half of the second act, uh, I will run through this quick because I want to leave time for, for discussion. Um, you know, we would have what we call early progress and then raising stakes. So uh, often in a Hollywood movie, you your character has made a first decision, made a first commitment to try and solve their problem. Um, and they take some first steps and things kind of work okay a bit. We have a progress montage often, you know? Um, and then things get increasingly tough until a point comes where they have a, um, a, like a make or break decision to make uh, right before the middle of the story where they can back off or go forward. And if they go forward, there's no turning back. It's like an irrevocable decision. Um, and uh, uh, then, the midpoint marks the moment they make that decision. And of course, you know, they don't back off because then it wouldn't be a story. So they make the decision, after which things accelerate and the oppositional forces uh, uh, go all in. Um, and things get harder very fast in whatever terms hard means in your story. And typically characters go through some kind of crisis. And the crisis 
strips away all their BS. The crisis is the moment where they're literally metaphorically close to death. Death can mean the death of hope. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, someone has a gun to your head. Uh, death, uh, death means I'm done, I can't do it, I'm failing, I'm failing. And the idea is that through that process of stripping away and seeing the world for what it is and seeing yourself for who you are and, and, and understanding the true nature of the problem, um, we end up with a moment of revelation. We end up with a moment where something important is learned, revealed, uh, confirmed. Uh, uh, again, plot-driven movie, I now have the sword, um, uh, or whatever it is. Uh, so that at the end of that act, we feel with them that they've got a chance to do whatever it is they want to do. Um, that's a real quick run through. The reason why I have the W form very quickly is because it kind of mimics this sort of emotional uh, um, mood of that sequence. So the first act is kind of a down mood because something has happened that shows me that I have a lack that I need to do something, that whether it's plot or, or, or story driven. There's something that I, that I have to have and I don't have it, but I'm gonna try. Okay, so I'm trying, up we go. Um, in the, the first half of the second act. I'm making some progress, it's tough, but I'm getting there. And then, uh-oh, I've got to take a, make a real commitment here. I've got to actually give of myself in a, in a true way. Uh, my, my emotions, my life, whatever it is. And then we're on a roller coaster, down we go. Um, through crisis. And then the third act, there's a chance, there's hope, up we go again. And we may succeed, we may fail, but the impetus is a positive impetus. So, you know, again, there's, there's so much more that we can say about stories. And again, uh, what I, what I, the way I use this is not as a model to beat stories with, but as a way of, of, of helping uh, students think about the kind of questions that uh, um, screenwriters typically ask at, at a given moment in a film. And that, you know, as a model to say, well, okay, if we're, gonna, if we're not gonna follow it, why not? And are we confident in that decision? Because this is sort of the default for, for most mainstream-ish films. Uh, so I think uh, this is probably, yes, this is probably where I will stop. I had a feeling that that's kind of where we'd get to. Um, uh, although I can certainly talk about the industry and context, you know, in, in Q and A. Um, but uh, I think, uh, um, why don't we take some questions? And um, if you have any, um, or, if, or if Catherine's collected now, I'm not sure quite how we're working it. Um, and we'll see where we go. And apologies for going fast. I wanted to try and get as much, uh, much info in for you guys as I could in the time we had. Hello, Adam, I, I, I see your hand. Um, I don't know whether, how are we doing things, Catherine? Are, are we uh, giving people, the power of speech. Hello, Julian. Can you hear me? I can, Adam. Hello. Yes. Nice to see you. What's up? Likewise. I just had a question about um, uh, like the character's goal and flaw and how that fits in with the theme or within the character's right. arc. Well, again, I mean, this is an excellent question, also a big one. But I think the idea of a character having a flaw is something, or at least, you know, uh, tragic character certainly having a flaw is something that we we go back in history through uh, uh, through tragedy. Uh, um, the idea of the, the tragic flaw is something that's embedded in Shakespeare and, uh, and other other writers, and certainly back to the Greeks. But the idea, more generally, of a flaw is the idea that that characters at the beginning of a story typically have something that they lack, and they're not very good at doing. Um, and that the, the character's arc and the theme it makes them deal with that thing that they're not good at doing. Um, and they, they have to learn, they have to develop their uh, um, uh, away from it. I mean, I, and we find this in, in, um, uh, in plot driven movies and also in, in character driven movies. So, you know, uh, there's a difference between a tragic flaw, which is um, perhaps a more uh, sort of overpowering problem, which is actually going to doom the tragic hero. So, you know, in Shakespeare's Macbeth, uh, Macbeth is ambitious. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which uh, leaps itself and falls on the other. And of course, Macbeth is, is doomed because he's overambitious. He rises above his station. Uh, but, you know, in a, I don't know, in a romantic comedy, um, you know, the, the, the terms are very different. Um, the terms are you know, I'm not good at talking to girls, so how am I going to get the girl? Um, or whatever it happens to be. And there are other, obviously there are many other iterations. Um, I have Emily. one for you. Yes. Yeah. Andre 
emailed a couple of questions earlier. The first one, when it comes to the final product of the script, what yeah. are agents or production companies looking for? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, okay. Uh, that's, that's a huge question. Uh, I think, let me say, let me say this, this is going to be depressing, but let me say this, that Hollywood doesn't buy movies anymore. Um, if you're interested in, if you have an original, original story, unless it's like a big ass action movie, in which case we'll pat your elbow. Uh, but Hollywood is really not in the business of buying, of buying scripts. Uh, Hollywood is in the business of assigning screenwriters to projects that they own. Uh, of course, there are scripts that are sold, but but compared to how things have been historically, not a, you know, Hollywood doesn't really buy scripts. So if you have a drama that you're interested in selling, you probably want to think about the small screen. Uh, that's part one. If you do have a big a big story to sell, um, then you have to kind of understand where Hollywood economics is right now. And the real shorthand for that is that where Hollywood studios are sort of work according to what loosely we call the tentpole paradigm. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's a term that's familiar to people, but real quick, it means this. The idea of a tentpole, right, is the big wooden pole that hangs the, you hang the canvas of the tent on. Uh, and the, the, the analogy is this. The idea is that studios think that they, and it's kind of a, a, a second order iteration of the blockbuster as a concept, that the studios will make a certain number, not very many, half a dozen, very, very big budget movies, tentpole movies, as they're called. The idea in principle being, in theory being, that um, uh, uh, if those make a lot of money, that hangs the tent, meaning that pays for all the studio's expenses, that, that keeps the lights on and all the rest of it, and that gives them the freedom to make riskier, lower budget movies. What, of course, the reality is, is that they just make the tent poles, and why do they need to bother with lower budget movies? Um, and they make very few of them. Um, you know, they make dramas occasionally, but that's really to to keep in with, uh, you know, to Oscar Hunt and to keep in with uh, um, uh, talent that they want to use for their big projects. They make some, some comedies, they make some horror films, they make some thrillers, but that's kind of it. Um, uh, and part of the reason for that is that the whole market has changed. So I'm not, this is turning into, I, I'm trying to avoid this turning into a lecture about, you know, Hollywood economics, but the whole market has changed in the last 15, 20 years, certainly in the last 10 years. And the massive change is that now, for the whole history of Hollywood, uh, money used to come primarily from domestic distribution, from the USA. Now, the biggest chunk of money comes from international. And for, for, to, for, to a large extent, this is because of the huge investment China has made in its, in, in its exhibition arm. The, the number of cinemas in China has uh, increased exponentially. I haven't got the figures in my head in the last 10 years. Um, so now, Hollywood is no longer primarily making movies for Americans. or well, not big movies. And that means that has a massive knock-on effect for the kind of films that they want. Um, and complex dialogue doesn't play internationally, for example. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's more complicated than that. But that's, a very, that's a very much a, a, a snapshot, but just to give you a sense of it. So, you know, when we think about screenwriting and what we're doing, uh, Hollywood, as we understand Hollywood, big studios, Hollywood is really not making movies anymore. It is interested in developing uh, a, a product from properties that it owns. It'll buy a few scripts, but really that's, that's a tough market. Whereas all of the interesting drama, including interesting action dramas and so on, science fiction, whatever, has moved to the small screen to what we might call expanded television, streaming services, SVOD and so on. Um, so it depends on, so to answer your question, mate, it depends on exactly what kind of a film you're conceiving of. The second, the final thing I'll say on that, because, you know, uh, is that um, Hollywood is also frightened of buying new things when it can do something that has a track record. So if you want to sell a big movie idea to Hollywood, the best thing you can do is get a track record for that product in some other medium. So you write a novel, you make a comic book or whatever, or something else, um, that then gets an audience, gets popularity, gets noticed, and then Hollywood might be interested in, in developing it. Um, but, there, but it's a fear-driven business. It's absolutely a fear-driven business. And it's also a business that thinks in terms of hundreds of millions of dollars of profit and isn't really interested in making a modest profit from a good movie. That model went out in the late 90s, early 2000s. 
I'm afraid, um, if not before, frankly. Uh, that was a long-winded answer, but I, I hope that's, that's made some sense in terms of, you know, what you're asking is a perfectly valid question, but you have to kind of set some context to think about that before. Um, and maybe we can move on. I, I'm not sure who's next, Raquel or Missy. Uh, I see your hands. Um, Why don't we, let's go to Missy first. Sure. Hi, Missy. Hello, can you hear me? Um, not very well. Uh, can oh. you get closer to Michael? Hey. Yeah. Sorry. Hi. Um, I was just wondering the W model. Yeah. Can that be used on um, like TV series? So like like per episode or like it could be for um, a whole arc. Right. Uh, I think the principles are there. I mean, obviously, when you're talking about TV. Again, this is a big complex topic. Um, and one of the things that's happening in television right now is that there's kind of a crisis, an interesting crisis, provocative crisis in what, it, what a TV show is. Because particularly now that we're moving into SVOD where we're moving out of the, the structure where you have you know, acts leading up to commercial breaks and so on, um, because SVOD typically, not always, but typically doesn't have commercial breaks in them. Dogs are fighting under the desk, so I hope you, if you hear weird noises, that's what it is. Um, uh, uh, the kind of nature, the, the, the very nature of what is an episode is kind of up for grabs, and you'll see so many different kind of iterations of that at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think that, that we, we see a lot of people who come into expanded television from film thinking of their shows as kind of long movies split into sections as opposed to episodic dramas where the episode itself has a, a valid structure where, where that uh, um, kind of legacy structure of the episode is not just something to be avoided or moved beyond but something to be cherished so missy i mean the, the overall the broad answer is uh, yes you can absolutely use the, the w to think about the arc of a sh uh, the arc of a, of, a, of a show but every every tv show has its own version of structure and often they're very similar to one another than just little nuances. But I mean, that was the case back in the in the network days and in um, you know basic cable, and it's also the case now. Um, and as I say, we're in a situation where where I think we're w there's a debate implicitly at least going on in TV as to you know what are we now? Um, and it's really interesting. And, and there's a lot of very bad shows out there, but there's some very very interesting and good ones as well. You know? Um, so I, I'm not sure that's a, uh, the best answer, but that's the, that's the answer I have right for you right now, Mrs. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Raquel. Or you just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a, a bit of a complex question. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing a bunch of writing classes. I feel like I've looked at kind of every story structure um, mm -hmm. under the sun at this point. And they all tend to boil down subplot to just the B story. Um, right. Quite essentially, I've been led to understand that usually it's the the romance plot or the friend plot uh, that mental, just reinforces, mental, yeah, sure. yeah, 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 reinforces theme for the main character. Right. My question is that not only just to have like a more interesting story with more complex supporting mm -hmm. characters, but also because there's a big push to not just have you know, minority supporting characters that uh -huh. only exist to prop up the main character. Right. Um, or just kind of how do you advise about going about a solid subplot where you're developing your secondary characters within that structure? Right. Again, a really interesting question. Uh, and I think it depends partly on the, the, the format. Uh, you know, is this TV, is this um, uh, movies and so on. But I think... Um, you know, there are different, again, there are different versions here. Uh, one version would be to think more more of an, uh, like an ensemble, right? Where you don't have um, distinct leads or your leads aren't that uh, uh, separate from, from the main group. And that gives you narrative space that you're going to fill with uh, whatever whatever's going on for those characters. Uh, another one is to think about how you, you, in TV, we think of kind of, you know, A story, B story, C story, D story, in a slightly different way than you do for, for movies. Um, and, you know, um, typically, the, the sort of typical TV iteration of that, I'm not a TV writer, so I'm, you know, if I get this wrong, someone can come in and correct me. But, you know, A story is the, the main plot, B story is kind of what our main characters do at home or elsewhere in their lives, their romantic life or whatever else is going on. Uh, C story is, you know, secondary characters. D story is comic relief. Or, I mean, there are different ways of, of, of that it works. 
you know, so again, I think it depends on, on kind of how you conceive of your cast and their role in the story. Um, and uh, the, 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 if you move away from that ABCD structure and find some other way uh, of making, making space within a, a broader cast or an ensemble, um, you know, that everyone has uh, uh, interesting and interweaved um, narrative arcs, then, then I think maybe you're getting somewhere with that. So, but again, I think, I think we're, we're kind of, people are experimenting with this right now. I mean, there's a lot of uh, um, sort of disparate story structures going on in expanded TV right now. And frankly, too many for me to keep track of. I'm kind of overwhelmed by it, to be honest. Um, and, um, but you know, uh, 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 for example, there's a show that I need to watch more that people have told me does this in, in an interesting way, like The Boys, um, which, you know, I think uh, uh, may be worth a look, uh, but there, I'm sure there are many others. Um, yes, Emily. Hi, uh, thanks so much. Yeah, I was wondering, um, like I was thinking about the Queen's Gambit, you know, uh -huh. series. I've only seen the first episode of that, but, but go on, I'll do my best. Okay, yeah, um, a show like that, I feel like um, it doesn't necessarily follow the typical like W of like, you no. know, these kind of like things. So um, I'm writing a romantic comedy limited series that's similar in that it's just like things happen and it's not necessarily like following a certain sure. um, beat structure. It's just kind of like the different things that happen between right. say, multiple be clear, the, w, the W's and feature films, not, not TV shows. So yeah, but go on, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess like, uh, I, I, I hmm, sorry, I started asking one question, but I think my actual question is, in, in a case where you maybe have an ensemble cast and you uh -huh. want to, uh, not, not like the Queen's Gambit, sorry. And um, you want to kind of uh, show the audience all of the characters, but then highlight a couple, a few of the uh -huh. characters at the beginning, but then in the maybe the third or fourth episode kind of switch it so that right. the audience realizes, oh, these other characters are actually more of the main characters. Right. Um, do you have any advice for pulling that off or other shows that have done that well? Uh, I think, well, the first thing to say, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of I'll give you a roundabout answer because I'm not, I, I'm not an expert in, in, again, in, in the structure of TV shows, but the roundabout answer is this. One thing that, that plays in, in your favor is the fact that certainly in SVOD, um, the notion of the pilot is something that, that has kind of gone by the wayside in many, in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, and, and, th and this deals with the issue of pacing and establishing a show, which is kind of what you're talking about, right? That, yeah, yeah. yes, we start here, but actually we have other interesting places to go. Um, and that what we first establish isn't, isn't going to be the model for every episode afterwards. We're going to, we're, we're developing a different way. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, um, at least last time I checked, uh, Netflix is telling its uh, producers uh, that people tend to watch three episodes in, to decide whether they like a show. Mm -hmm. uh, not just a, not just a, um, uh, um, a single episode. Uh, so you know the sense in which you used to put everything that you had into a first episode and set up a kind of repeatable structure. This is now for for some SVOD producers at least distributors. This is now less less uh, less important, um, mm -hmm. and that you can take longer to establish the rhythms of a show, which could include the kind of things that you're talking about. Um, I, I don't have a specific example. Again, I, you know, as I say, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more from the movie end than the, um, the, the TV show end. But someone, someone else might, for all I know, um, have, uh, uh, um, have an example. I think. Um, Thank you. But that's. But the sense. Sorry, very quickly. I'll. I'll, 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 I'll I think the sense in which TV shows uh, have been a, have been allowed to slow down their storytelling is potentially a very important intervention which goes to enabling the kind of storytelling you're talking about it's also sometimes absolutely dumb as hell because some some shows <laughs> it, it seems to me take way too long to get going and i've lost the will to live by the time i get past episode two and i and i and i just don't trust that they'll interest me by episode seven unless somebody who loves it and whose opinion i respect comes and slaps me in the face and say don't be an idiot keep going you know <laughs> so it's, a, it's kind of a double-edged sword and it goes back to what I was saying about TV series or TV, expanded television, streaming TV, kind of being in an interesting transitional stage right now. So I, I acknowledge, Emily, that that's not a, in some ways, that's not a coherent answer to what you're saying, but that's, I guess, where I would, where I would offer you some encouragement, at least, to be thinking more creatively, as you obviously are, about how to structure your show. 
Thank you. That's super encouraging. And also this has been like the best talk I've participated in, in my last like three months of like intensive study about this. So thank you. It's oh. I, well, I'm delighted you found it useful. Um, again, you know, I, I, I don't know whether, whether this is something that, that's on the cards, but I, I know we, uh, perhaps I'm, you know, out of, out of turn talking about it, but we did have a, a, a vague discussion um, with uh, uh, the society about possibly establishing uh, some kind of, some kind of class. So, um, that may be something down the track that will happen. Uh, Catherine, feel free to squash that <laughs> if you want to. Uh, but I, I know that was that was sort of raised as a possibility. So I mean, we might we might be able to talk again in some in some form. Um, and and for that for that matter, I, I mean, I, I can't. By the way, no offense, but I can't read everyone's script. Uh, I just don't have the bandwidth. But if anyone does have a question or or something that we haven't been able to cover, or you don't like, you know, talking in public or whatever else, um, in this presentation. Uh, uh, you know, and it's it isn't going to take me three weeks of research to to, to find out. I, I'm certainly happy to, you know, Catherine uh, um, um, and Tessa are very welcome to put people you know in contact with me, and I'll do my best to be helpful. Uh, and again, apologies, I, I I can't I can't read you know even even long shorts because I have enough of those from my lovely students, and indeed some of my ex students who who sneak in and go oh go on, um, you know so. Uh, but thank you, Emily. I appreciate the sentiment. Um, I, I, do we have time for any more, or I guess we're coming towards the end of? The no, we we do. I can take myself right back off camera. I do have one in my email if you want one more. Please. Okay. I, I mean, listen, guys, we're at the time, so you know, I will not feel uh, feel offended if people if people leave. But um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, other than my dogs are getting bored, uh, I I have no <laughs> I have no place to go tonight. So uh, I'm happy to take some more questions if it's useful to people. Well, we do have one here from Maria Behan. Uh, this is getting back to TV a little bit, but a question about- Sorry, by the way, j j just to insert here, I'm delighted people are talking about TV and I'm, I'm doing my best to learn uh, you know, uh, more about TV because it's the coming medium. It's all the good writing apart from really cool action movies. And I like, I like me a really cool action movie every now and again, but I also like you know, movies that make me think. Um, so, you know, all the really good writing is, is moving to TV. So I absolutely mm -hmm. encourage you to keep thinking in that frame, by the way. Sorry, Catherine, please carry on. No, not at all. That's a, a, a really good um, segue. Um, do you have any tips about writing a spec script for one of mm -hmm. the streaming platforms? Um, not, I, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I think it depends what you mean. Some of them are actually going to still taking, uh, still making one off films. Um, and indeed, there's a whole, I mean, I'm sure you've been following it, there's a whole controversy about whether or not, you know, Netflix movies or Amazon movies uh, um, are, should be eligible for Oscars, for example. You know, we have this with Roma and uh, I can't remember now, but a bunch of films. Uh, so there's that. There's that. It's, that is still part of expanded television. Um, and then, of course, there are, there are series. I mean, I think, you know, what you would start by doing, I mean, Netflix is, it's a, I mean, Netflix makes everything and I, I really, apart from the algorithms speak to them and they follow their algorithms, I, I can't, I can't claim to be a guru on that on what Netflix is doing because I frankly don't understand it. Um, but be wary of Netflix, by the way, because Netflix's algorithms tell them to cancel shows after season two. Um, by the way, uh, because the profitability, because after season two, uh, usually people people's contracts to make a show, you know, a kind of their pay is, is sort of bound for two seasons. After season two, uh, everyone gets paid a lot more. Um, so typically Netflix gives a show two seasons and it has to be really stonking in some way uh, um, for them to give them to give it more than two, two seasons. Um, uh, and there are, there's a kind of hard nosed economic thinking behind that that has nothing to do with whether the show has built up a nice little audience and is doing okay. Um, so be wary, be wary of that. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not an expert on, on, uh, uh, on pitching shows to, to streaming services, other than the opportunities to be innovative and creative are genuinely there. That, you know, uh, uh, all of these services are absolutely taking innovative and interesting um, uh, uh, takes on, on established genres. Um, and they're also much more flexible when it comes to the kind of, of, of series you're offering, yeah? That you don't have to be pitching, because the economic model has changed completely. Um, you don't have to be pitching like a 20X episode a, a, a year 
um, show like you would have had to pitch to, um, uh, well, you still have to pitch to networks or basic cable in, in some iterations um, in order to achieve um, syndication because syndication was the way in which TV shows made money. They, they were loss leaders for the first seasons until they went into syndication and then they made a fortune. Um, so now that, that syndication is not a, really a thing, um, the, the, the whole budgetary basis of television has changed completely, um, um, or at least of, of streaming television uh, has changed completely, um, and that now it's subscriber-based, um, they're much more flexible, much more interested in miniseries, in short, short run single seasons, you know, eight, 10, 12 episodes, and also in repeating uh, series at, at, a, at a shorter length. Um, so that gives in real creative flex flexibility um, to storytellers. And it means that, you know, you can tell a story well and discreetly without having to overextend it so it fits a, a, um, uh, one of these kind of endless ongoing um, um, structures. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I make no claims to be a, an established TV, TV writer. That's not my that's not my area. But I am I am, as it happens, doing my best to learn and also writing some some sort of critical material on that. Um, Do you have time uh, yeah. for one so, more? Yeah, of course. Keep okay, going. Let, what, we're going to take uh, one more. And Nicholas, I see your comment there. Um, I am trying to unmute you. <laughs> Hold on one second. Let me go into the gallery view here and see if I see you. There you are. Um, hi, Julianne. It's it's uh, nice. To Hello, I know who this is. Hey, yeah. Nick, how are you doing, mate? It's good to see you in my living room. <laughs> um, so you were just saying television isn't really your thing, but I have a I have a TV question because I I, I really like. I know TV is in many ways your thing. So go yeah, on, yeah. It is it is my thing. So Netflix, you know, it's it's a revelation, and there's a lot of good shows, there's a lot of bad shows. There's a great British Bake Off, which is a great show, <laughs> um, non-scripted. My question is about network television because ah. I would argue that it's pretty bad. And mm -hmm. um, you know, you're saying the temples, the temple films are are written with a, a Chinese audience in mind and uh, inter international audiences in mind. Sure. So they maybe lack some nuance, but the but the network shows are for American audiences. So right. So why and you have like people who went to film school who are writing scripts for these shows. So why why are they just so bad? <laughs> you know, first of all, I have to say I'm out of touch with networks. Oh, we cut the cable this year, um, so I, I'm actually as as far away from from being up to date on what the networks are doing as I've ever been since I came uh, over to to this fine country of yours uh, twelve years ago. Um, uh, I'm not actually in touch, but I mean, look. In some ways, it's because um, the 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 structure of a network show, even good ones, uh, requires a formula in a way that I, I think you know we're moving away from in other in other iterations of television. Um, the, the 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 relationship between sort of a series and seriality, right? Um, uh, to what extent are we are, is our story ongoing? To what extent are we repeating a, a, a structure for each episode? Uh, you know, each week it's a monster of the week or whatever's going on. It's, you know, law and order, um, the case, the case. Um, so I, I, I think I think in some ways that they're, they're bound by um, the, uh, uh, those structures. They're also, I think, losing audiences, particularly audiences, you know, below the age of 96, um, who, you know, are going elsewhere or at least beginning to. And that means that, you know, they're, they're having to adjust to a different or increasingly adjust to a different kind of audience base. Young people don't watch, I mean, you know, to my knowledge, young people really don't watch network anymore. Um, so that's changing the, the, the kind of framing of a lot of shows. Uh, but I'm, again, I, you know, Nick, I apologize, but I'm, I, you know, I'm not really current with, with network policies. Well, that's but, probably you know, all, best all these changes are putting different kinds of pressures on the network. Right. Um, so I'm sure that's that's a lot to do with it. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's it's better for you to not be aware. I, sometimes <laughs> I, I I accidentally watch the show. I'm like, oh my god, turn the channel. Right. Switch, switch. But then, dude, I I I've taken random random punts at some net some Netflix shows that I'm just what the hell. So yeah, I mean, some of them are know, pretty dark. It's not it's not just the networks, but um, but also look, hang on. The other thing to say real quickly is that also the networks actually have been taking making some weird experimental choices. 
I mean, can you believe that? I think it was NBC. Uh, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Can you believe that NBC ran three series of Hannibal? I mean, what? Um, uh, so th th I think that there's a kind of schizophrenic thing that, that, that you know, is happening at some networks that their audience base is changing and shrinking at the same time that other models are, 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 are developing elsewhere. Um, you know, the, um, and who, who are they, you know, are, are they looking for niche audiences? Are they looking to kind of uh, go down the, the mainstream of the mainstream of the mainstream route? But yeah, I, 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 again, as I say, this is kind of a bit out of my wheelhouse. So I, I, I apologize if, you know, anyone who works in TV can if, please come in and correct me. I'm, I, this is not my, my, uh, my primary area. Um, well, Julian, uh, we are, we're at 740. You have given us extra time. I just, um, I, I want to thank everybody who's here and um, I'm sorry, I'll turn my video back on too. And to just a huge thank you for coming to share your expertise with us tonight. Um, I, I think absolutely we'll talk about how to bring you back here and in what capacity that looks, what that looks like. Um, and for those of you who are still on, keep an eye on your inbox because what we're going to do tomorrow is Tess and I will send out a survey. Um, do you want to connect with one another? Do you want to come back and take more classes? Uh, what kind of classes do you want to take, whether they're episodic, periodic, whatever? Um, so keep an eye for that because we want to hear from you. Also super thrilled to hear so many young people on this um, on this Zoom call tonight. That's really exciting and keep, keep writing. Um, Julian, any parting thoughts before we head out for the night? Uh, sure. Uh, what I would say is this, whatever you're writing, if you're, if you're writing a script, whether it's a five page script or a feature film or a pilot for a TV show, finish your draft. The biggest, the biggest, most important advice I give you is finish your draft. Okay, maybe it's not the best thing in the world. Maybe it will metaphorically sit on your shelf. Several of my scripts are, are doing that right now and you'll never show it to anyone ever. But finish your draft because then you'll know that you can you know that you can get to the end and your next one will be better. Maybe this one will be great, who knows? The second thing I'd say is I happen to notice uh, on the, uh, the schedule for future speakers that my friend and colleague, Joe McBride is coming in a few weeks to talk about, uh, uh, I guess, uh, um, writing bi Hollywood biography and so on. Uh, he is without a doubt the greatest biographer of, of uh, classical film directors uh, um, writing today. Uh, uh, he's a fount, a fount of wisdom and knowledge, and extraordinary that what he knows. Uh, so I could not recommend uh, uh, um, Joe to you more, more highly. I'm sure the other people are great, but uh, but I, I know Joe, so I'm <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm I'm plugging I'm plugging Joe. Um, uh, uh, you try and catch him out. Uh, prepare difficult questions for him about Hollywood cinema in 1923, and he will do it. Well, maybe, I don't know about 1923, but 1939, <laughs> certainly. Anyway, on that note, thank you guys for your attention. Uh, I hope some of it made sense. I know I, I zipped through a whole bunch of things very quickly. Um, and good luck. And it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Stay safe out there. And we'll see you back here soon. I love that the dog has made an appearance right now. Oh, yes. Scoot, <laughs> everyone. Scoot. <laughs> night, night. Good night, all. <laughs>